When it comes down to it, there's not a lot of things that can change the world. If you exclude extraterrestrial things like the sun, moon, or an asteroid, then the list becomes pretty small. And if we talk about changes that have an observable impact in our lifetime, well, excluding ourselves, the only thing left over are volcanoes. Natural disasters can have truly devastating consequences, but only a strong volcanic eruption in the right place can have consequences for everyone, everywhere. But why do volcanoes even exist? Where do they come from? And why are some different from others? The heart of all volcanoes is their magma. As a kid, you may have wondered if a volcano would pop up randomly nearby where you live and maybe question why that doesn't happen. After all, magma clearly comes from inside the Earth, so what's stopping it from coming to the surface here? Well, magma isn't actually abundant in the interior of the Earth. So where does magma come from? The collection of tectonic plates on which we live comprises what we call the lithosphere. These solid structures sit on the lower more viscous asthenosphere, or the upper layer of the mantle. As these plates slowly move around, they bump and force themselves into each other. If one plate is denser than the other, it can be pushed underneath the less dense one. There are two main compositions of plates, those with denser oceanic crust and those with less dense continental crust. Oceanic crust is mostly mafic in composition, which means there's a lot of magnesium and iron which forms a nicely organized array with other silicate structures. Continental crusts are more felsic in composition, which means a lot of silicon is present, forming large complexes of tetrahedral networks and cations. Because of their different compositions and densities, if these plates collide, the ocean plate will be pushed down underneath the continental one. This behavior can also occur when two oceanic plates meet, and we'll discuss this a little later. Now when we look at a map, we can see that volcanoes predictably exist where oceanic plates meet continental plates. But what processes cause this? As an oceanic plate subducts beneath a continental plate, it experiences both an increase in temperature and pressure. The composition of the subducting lithosphere isn't much different from the asthenosphere, so this heat and pressure increase shouldn't be much of an issue. But during subduction, the lithosphere brings with it contaminants other than just the silicon, oxygen, and cations forming up their structure. The two primary contaminants we are concerned with in this process are water and carbon dioxide. Before we discuss their role in magma, let's appreciate the intuition of why contaminants change the physical properties of whatever they happen to be contaminating. We'll look at the example of salt in water. When we freeze water, the molecules within organize to form this solid lattice structure. Now if we imagine a contaminant like a salt ion, this disrupts potential hydrogen bonds from forming. So it makes more sense for the nearby water molecules to detach and remain liquid. Not only can they form pseudo-ionic bonds with this ion, but their mingling also increases the average amount of hydrogen bonds they can create, thus producing more stability. This principle holds true to any contaminant in any material. As the contaminant disrupts their lattice structure, the molecules in a material can achieve more stability by interacting in their liquid form than remaining in their solid form. Thus, contaminants cause a breakdown in lattice structure quicker, or in other words, lowers the melting point. As the pressure and temperature increase, the water and CO2 molecules within the lithosphere enter their gas phase. But due to the extreme pressure, there's nowhere for them to go, so these contaminants stick around and disrupt the lattice structure of the lithosphere material. This causes it to melt into a semi-liquid phase. Since liquids are less dense than solids, this semi-liquid magma slowly begins to rise back up towards the surface. Eventually, the magma will reach the Moho discontinuity, or the bottom of the crust. Because the crust is less dense than the mantle, the buoyant forces pushing the magma to the surface weakens, and as a result, the vast majority of formed magma begins to pool up here. In fact, most magma never reaches the surface. It simply solidifies and crystallizes here, mixing with the surrounding material. If, however, enough magma pools up underneath, the upwards force can cause enough stress on the crust to cause cracks and fissures to form, at which point herb magma can continue to rise. This process creates the magma on tectonic plate boundaries. But you may have noticed on our map or simply know that there are volcanoes in the middle of tectonic plates, like the Kilauea volcano in Hawaii. Some magma actually can come from within the Earth itself, in the form of a hot spot. Although the mantle is technically not a liquid, over geological time periods it behaves like a fluid. As a result, when the internal heating of the planet isn't uniform, a section of mantle will become warmer than the surrounding mantle. As a result, this extra heat makes this section of mantle less dense, which then causes it to rise. 
Normally, the temperatures within the mantle would be enough to melt it, but the extreme pressure prevents this. However, as the warm section of mantle rises, pressure decreases causing decompressive melting into a more liquid composition. As a result, it becomes even less dense and rises even faster. Eventually, it too reaches the Moho discontinuity, and after enough has pooled, it will force its way to the surface. The coolest thing about hotspots is that you can see the path a tectonic plate traveled above it as the column underneath it continually poked up at it with magma. So now that we know where magma forms, we probably want to know what makes them different. Why are some volcanoes effusive and others explosive? This property is tied to gas content in the magma. Remember, carbon dioxide, water, and these other gases I haven't mentioned all accumulate with the magma in the magma chamber. And just like a carbonated beverage, the gas would like to leave, but it's held in place by the pressure surrounding it. So very similarly to opening a shaken beverage, if the pressure is suddenly reduced, like the rupturing of an overhead rock ceiling, this decrease in pressure causes gas to escape and expand from the lava. The expansions inevitably expose more lava to the air, which causes more gas to escape, causing more expansion, and so on and so on, and thus you have an explosion. So the more gas in a magma, the more explosive it is. But what dictates the gas content of a magma? This property is controlled by the magma's viscosity. Strongly mafic or liquidy magmas have very small solid fragments within them, hence why they behave like a liquid. As a result, it's very easy for gas to escape and interchange with its surroundings. However, very viscous and felsic magmas have very large crystallizations and solid complexes within them, making it more difficult for trapped gases to find their way out. So the higher the silicon oxide content and subsequently the higher the viscosity, the more volatiles or gases that can be trapped inside. Therefore it is these highly viscous felsic magmas that are responsible for the strong explosive eruptions that we love. Finally, the last question to ask is, what dictates what kind of magma is formed? As magma passes through and interacts with the overlying crust, it melts and incorporates a lot of the crust material within the magma itself. Since roughly 90% of magma that reaches the surface forms in the ocean, most of it is of liquid mafic composition. Earlier we mentioned that two oceanic plates can meet up, and whichever plate is denser will subduct underneath to form magma. As a result, the rising magma interacts with mafic ocean crust. Therefore, volcanic islands like the Galapagos and the Aleutians all formed from mafic magma and experience effusive eruptions. However, when magma rises through and interacts with continental crust, not only is continental crust thicker, it also has a high silicon content. Incorporating the silicon makes the magma more felsic and thus more viscous. An easy way to determine eruption type of a volcano is by its shape. Steeper volcanoes or stratovolcanoes generally are explosive, whereas shield volcanoes with low grades and wide bases are effusive. Stratovolcanoes are of utmost importance because they can send cubic kilometers worth of material into the stratosphere. While suspended at high altitudes, this material reduces solar insulation and subsequently cools the entire planet. Paleoclimatologists believe that ancient volcanoes roughly 250 million years ago caused the worst mass extinction seen resulting in the end of the Paleozoic era. And a little over 200 years ago, the Tambora eruption caused massive food shortages in Europe, which ultimately triggered the creation of the institution where I now study. These climate-altering eruptions only occur roughly every 600 years, and even then their impacts rarely last more than two years. But it's still magnificent the impact the Earth can have on itself. So remember, if you ever wanted to see yourself grow, well, even the Earth knows that great change must come from within.